everybody. Welcome. Uh, my name is Michael Manley. I'm a partner at Venable. We're very happy you're here for our next in our RCOM series, Risk and Culture, How to Maximize Good Firm Culture to Mitigate Risk to the Organization. A few housekeeping items. This is roughly going to last about an hour. Each of our panelists will uh, be featured at different points, but hopefully going to be a little interactive. Uh, this is being recorded. So keep it clean. Um, we also have people who are <coughs> in to listen. So there are people on the phone. And for the lawyers in the room, we are offering CLE credit. So uh, be sure to you know provide us the right information to get your CLE credit. And I think uh, I've covered all the things I was supposed to cover. Uh, last thing, just in terms of other venerable folks, my partner George Castellampros is here from DC. We have uh, Eric Prager, who has just joined us uh, as of last week, and we have Donna Brown, all of whom uh, help uh, participate in our risk and compliance group. So please uh, make sure to say hello to them at, uh, after, the, uh, after the session. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to our moderator, Alice, and we'll get going. Hi, everybody. Welcome. And it's great to see so many familiar faces. Um, from uh, Fordham Law School. Just real quick shameless plug in case you don't know Fordham Law School, which is Michael's alma mater and also Scott's, um, Scott Mazarski at the end. Uh, the, we now offer uh, compli two compliance degrees, two masters in um, corporate compliance, an LLM for um, holders of first degrees in law, uh, and an MSL, which is a, a master's degree for non-lawyers. So it's an interesting fact I wanted to share. Without further ado, let me introduce our esteemed panelists today. We have, we have a great mix of, I think, practitioners, um, advisors in the space, and uh, one behavioral scientist, which I'll, I'll start with, Scott Rigby. So um, Scott is our resident behavioral scientist today. Uh, he's helping firms with his company, Immersive, identify and manage culture uh, with, I think, good tips on how to measure um, internal cultures and, and what to do with those measurements once you have them. Um, to his right is Michael Manley. Uh, he's going to leverage a lot of his experience as a former CCO, but he's currently a partner here at Venable. Um, next to him is George Castellampros, who is also a partner at Venable, but a former um, SEC uh, staff member in the enforcement division, so it'll be interesting to hear his insights um, from that perspective. Uh, James Clement, uh, next to him, is a VP of Fiduciary uh, Services at Emeritus Investments Corporation, and then lastly, we have Scott Mazarski, who is president of Bloomberg Law. So I think we've assembled a really great panel. I'm the senior director of the compliance programs, as you might have guessed, at Fordham Law School, and I'm a former compliance officer, so hopefully um, we'll have a great discussion today. Let's take a look at what we're going to cover. We're going to start um, by going through a, a fact pattern, a case study, which I'm just going to ask you to keep in your mind as we go through the discussion. We'll hit some particular questions pertaining to that case study, but I think it's a good way to sort of set the scene and think about all the topics we're going to be tackling from the theoretical to the practical. We're going to talk about the definition of culture, indications of firm culture, risks associated with culture, get the regulatory view, um, how culture impacts risk, and then lastly, hopefully give you some good tips to walk away with to how to manage culture and affect positive change uh, from within. And one uh, disclaimer on the fact pattern, it is uh, fictional. It's not related to any actual real life events. So please, to the extent it seems similar, it's not. <laughs> Okay, so he, here's our case study. A large multinational publicly traded financial services firm with more than 20,000 employees worldwide, Alpha, uh, recently acquired a large well-known broker dealer, Omega. It is the largest acquisition completed by Alpha in its 90-year history. Within six months of the acquisition, Congress amends the tax code, which significantly reduces the total return on Omega's most successful investment product. To compound this problem, the integration of Omega with the rest of the firm is going poorly, and many of the firm's rising stars are leaving, which is being reported in the news. As a result of these events, Alpha's stock price is sagging. Alpha's CEO issues a call to action and sets quarter over quarter sales targets of 2.5% growth to exceed the firm's forecast by year end by at least 10%. Part of this call to action includes a new commission plan designed to handsomely reward Omega brokers who beat the new sales target. So hopefully some red flags are already sort of popping out at you, but we're going to um, 
keep keep that in the back of your mind as we go through some of the next slides. I'm going to turn to um, the definition of of culture. It's a it's a much discussed topic, a buzzword of the day, um, and it's a great place for us to start our discussion. I suspect there are varying interpretations of that term and concept um, between our participants, but let's start with our behavioral scientist Scott Rigby for his take on culture, and then get some reactions from the other panelists. Sure. Thanks, Alice. Um, you know, we have some of these up here now, and easily can be hundreds more. And you know, the, the one thing uh, I'll point out is. Obviously, it's a complex topic because all these definitions are combining a lots of verbs and nouns and adjectives that we all kind of in our gut uh, think we understand. We know it when we see it. But the challenge is how are you going to define these things? I, I would um, put a little bit of a different definition on it. Is I, I think about culture as what I call the shared schema within the organization. And schema is probably where people have uh, an understanding of, but in psychology, it really refers to uh, a, a mental map or a framework that we're bringing to bear in how we behave. And uh, just as an example, if we all were to get up from here right now and walk across the street to a restaurant that we've never been to before, um, none of us is worried that we won't know how to behave, right? We know how restaurants work. You walk in, you wait, you say, I have three people, you wait some more, you sit down, you get handed a menu, order a drink. We know the drill. We don't even have to have been to the restaurant before, right? Because we have a schema for what happens in restaurants and we have implicit and explicit rules about that. And we actually have those mental models happening all the time. It's what helps us to be successful and interact and grow. And so really when we talk about culture, we're talking about that schema that we have for operating within, um, within the organization. But of course the added dimension is it's, there's a shared schema. We have to figure out consensually what is that rule set in the same way we do in a restaurant or in a lot of other circumstances. And so it's that implicit and explicit rule set and mental model that each of us carry around individually um, that we're sharing with others. And the, the one point that I'm, I'm making there, and I'm gonna come back to, I think, throughout, is that um, ultimately culture, we talk about it as this penumbra, as this singular thing, um, but really it, it comes down to the perspective of each individual and how um, that gets uh, connected with others. But really the locus of culture is in each individual and it's, it's kind of built from the ground up um, in a lot of ways, and we're going to talk more, talk more about that idea because it's a little different than the idea that culture is somehow imputed to people from just from the top down. Who would like to jump in and share any additional thoughts that you have on culture? Would you say that he that Scott pretty much nailed it? Look, I, in terms I nailed of, it, Mike. Yeah, you nailed it. You nailed it. So uh, we can just move on. We're Mike done. Uh, <laughs> great seeing everybody. Here. Uh, so in, in terms of clients, in terms of business, in terms of the challenges that you're all facing, uh, you know, different regulators, for example, in financial services have articulated elements of this topic. So in financial services, the culture of compliance has been, you know, uh, bandied about and we've got guidance from regulators. And over the years, we kind of thought we, we, we came to a conclusion. We knew what that meant. And then recently, and we'll talk more about this uh, back in 2016, the former uh, head of FINRA, uh, Rick Ketchum, had uh, remarks where he said, we're now going to start looking at the behavioral psychology behind culture, and maybe uh, we're going to evaluate firm culture. So this is a topic that is continuing to get, um, you know, treatment <coughs> and thought. There's thoughts by regulators, SEC, FINRA, and overseas. The, there are international regulators who are also talking about this on a regular basis. So, And I think to Scott's point, it, there's always a lot of focus on the output, right? What did you do? Mm -hmm. But a lot of it comes down to you sort of, you know, how did you do it and what were you thinking mm -hmm. when you were doing it? And I think to the extent you can find common patterns or instill common values within an organization, you get to your, your point about belief, Scott, and, yeah. and that's really what drives a culture. Yeah. I really like the idea that the locus of culture is with the individual and it all starts here, right? I think we oftentimes think of culture as something we adopt in an organization, um, but actually culture is, what I'm hearing is culture is really a, a byproduct of our uh, ourselves and what we bring to an organization and making those connections. Can we turn to indicators of firm culture now? Um, I think we've all got a good sense of what culture is, um, but what exactly are the indicators of a good firm culture versus one that needs some self-correction? Um, Scott, would you like to? Yeah, I'll, so I'll talk for a few minutes about this because this is where I think there's an opportunity for um, us to be leveraging 
uh, a pers- some new perspectives in understanding culture, both in terms of um, how we approach it conceptually, but also how do we measure it? <laughs> what are the indicators? Because uh, really, when you get down to brass tacks, there needs to be a way to implement these sorts of things. So let me start by saying that, um, and this is something I mentioned before, culture is very complex and multifaceted. And you, you've got two kind of domains of indicators of, of corporate culture. Uh, the first is what you're observing, and this is the common one that you're tracking because it's the easiest one to track. Uh, what are the behaviors? Where Are people actually being compliant? Um, are they being deviant? Uh, what, what's, what are the communications? What, what's happening? Um, what's being expressed, right? But there's another set of variables that we've already touched on as being really important, um, and that's what's happening psychosocially, what's happening internally uh, in each of the employees in terms of their sense of purpose, values, engagement. Um, and we're going to get into something uh, in detail in just a minute called motivational quality. Um, if you think about it, behaviors are lagging indicators. And this is one of the challenges. You can, you can react, and there obviously need to be good ways to react to problems in culture or what you're seeing in culture. But if you want to impact culture, lagging indicators aren't terribly valuable. Behaviors aren't terribly valuable. You need to get upstream and understand what's happening in the experience of employees and in all these areas. And so, you know, if we go on to the next slide, um, yeah, I think... Yes. Yeah, so the next the next question I get asked is all the time as a behavioral scientist, which is, can you really measure these things? I mean, honestly, can you, can you measure these factors? These are nice ideas, but can they be measured? And the answer is, yep, you can do it. There's this whole field called social science that's been working on doing exactly this for you know decades now, right? So there are um, uh, ways in which there are well validated frameworks for understanding, uh, and I'm going to go over one in a minute that we use from self-determination theory, uh, which is one of the widest used frameworks in the world for really understanding what's happening in the interior life and motivations of individuals. Is the goal there, and this is another thing that happens with behavioral science, to uh, manipulate or change control or, you know, big brother? Absolutely not. Right? I mean, the orientation here is to really help everyone to have a great work life and contribute to a great culture. It's just a matter of understanding and being able to track what's going on. And so we can quantify these things. And if we go to the next slide, I want to talk in particular about what I think is a a very important key cultural tracking metric, an indicator that you can track in the organization and that you can also take action on. Um, Motivation is something that uh, we all have a definition for that word, and we use that very liberally. what's really motivating that decision. And when we look at a lot of the regulatory actions and things, there's, there's a question of what, what do you value the things you need to value? What's your motivation? It's implied that we're trying to get um, at what's going on inside the intentions of the people involved. Um, that's true for ethics and a lot of other areas. Motivational quality really refers to the fact that motivation is not a single thing that you have more or less of. This is traditionally how we talk about it, right? I need to have more motivation. I want to and, and it's also something that we tend to act like we give to other people. <laughs> I need to motivate my employees more. I need to motivate my company more. So we're the actors, and somehow we're going to instill or imbue this magical substance motivation and try to increase it. But the reality is we know that motivation is not all the same thing. It's multidimensional. You can be motivated for good and bad reasons. So it's not the quantity of motivation. It's really the quality of it. And if we go to the next slide, I think we've got a, a picture of this. Um, this is not just a conceptual picture, by the way. These are things that we can measure. And uh, just to give you a, a quick sense for how we do that, uh, we have a platform called Motivation Works that we can deploy in a scalable way to an organization, to all employees. And in about a seven-minute survey, we'll be able to, mention, to, to measure all of these different dimensions uh, of motivation to compute a motivational quality score for employees, for departments, for teams. But really, all of these things are happening when we're motivated to do something. This is from a poor quality motivation on the left going to higher quality motivation on the right. But if I walk across this, the lowest form of motivational quality is when we're motivated by external things, right? We're motivated by a threat of punishment or a shiny object that's being dangled in front of us, like money or some kind of a reward. Now, these are very common mechanisms that we use because, again, they're easy. They're easy. I, I, I have a new puppy at home. If I want to train that puppy, the easiest thing I can do is start to dangle things in front of it. Very effective in short term for the action, right? The problem is that's a low form of motivational quality, which is, means that that's not going to take root and really drive um, the kinds of uh, values and culture and ethics that we want and compliance that we want. 
Moving up from that, there's another set of, of poor motivational quality called uh, internal controlled. Sometimes we call it interjected in psychology. But that's when, even if there's not an explicit external control manipulating me, I feel a sense of, I should do this. I need to outperform Bob. I need to, you know, there's this sense of internal pressure that's coming from the culture. I need to uh, kind of company politics. I need to, you know, somehow perform in a certain way. And again, that might be internal to me as a person, but that doesn't make it mine. It's external to myself and what I personally value, right? We can measure these things discreetly. And when you look at people who are primarily motivated by those things, you see all of these bad outcomes. We have lots of data on it, more deviance, less satisfaction with compensation, less productivity, essentially um, a lot of negative outcomes. However, when you, get, when you get to people who are predominantly motivated by, I personally value the action that I'm engaging in. I personally endorse. I see the value. I truly see the value personally in, in customer first or in the regulations or in the rules. Now we're talking about a higher form of motivational quality we call identified. And at the highest end, you have people who, they just love doing their jobs. They just find it interesting and fun for the sake of doing their jobs, right? And this is what we all wish that we had every day. And sometimes we get it, right? But at the very least, even if you can't have that. We don't get it every day? <laughs> you probably do. You probably do. So, so when we measure these things, we actually measure, people don't fall into one bucket or the other. You can actually, uh, you know, just one other quick example, and then I'll kind of wrap up this opening thing for, for more comment from the panel. But, you know, I have a treadmill desk in my office, and when I'm walking on it, if you say, well, what's my motivation for walking on it? Well, you know, I have a mix of things. Um, yes, I, I do personally value it. I like the energy I get out of it in the afternoon. It gives me more energy to play with my daughter. So I have personal value. But guess what? I also don't like the fact I'm getting older and, uh, you know, I'm putting on a few pounds and so I have this sense of I should be doing this. You know, so I have multiple reasons going on. And this is why it's important to measure all of these things. But you can measure them and get essentially a profile. So you can see are people generally scoring in the higher motivational quality or lower. When you have that, you can then begin to come in and, and take effective action because you've got a barometer of what's happening in the culture that's a leading indicator of some of the risk and compliance issues that come up. And so I think there's one more slide in my little piece here, but I, I've kind of made this point is we actually have data that shows that when you have high motivational quality, this is driving a lot of positive outcomes. The same way low motivational quality is driving more risk, less performance, you're going to get more compliance, less deviant behavior. The, the great news is you're also gonna get greater performance, commitment, engagement by employees. And so it really is a, it's, it's a, it's a, a tide that raises all boats. So is is the idea that I heard you say this before? We we're all we can all be motivated for good or for for less good, right? Bad. Um, so is the idea that we're essentially hiring the right people, but we are not helping them reach their best and achieve their best? Or does this start at the HR point, at the hiring point, where we have to get better at identifying people who are motivated by those external factors versus those who are this motivated by the internal? This is a great question. This is a great question. Um, this is not a, um, a, a trait characteristic. It's not about trying to go out and weed out the good people from the bad people, yeah, right? right. That, that's the great opportunity here is that we can take actions, and I'll just you know, relate it back to the case study. What we know, one other thing that I'll mention, and we may circle back to it, is if I communicate to you that what's important, you know, what gets measured gets optimized, right? It, 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 if I communicate to you that making this financial target or earning this commission is what's important, then essentially I've anchored you purely in kind of an external position. And not only will that decrease your motivational quality, but there's something else that's really important that we see uh, in the research is, to the extent I had personal value for that activity, you will erode it. You will actually destroy that. So I might come in and I might feel like I really want to be working with customers and helping customers whenever. If you begin to incentivize me and make that the dominant motivational factor, you will begin to undermine and erode that personal value. So it can become very dangerous. But to your question, everyone has the opportunity to move deeper if we put the right kind of a culture in place that facilitates internalizing and deepening motivation. Yeah, that's great. Do the panelists have some thoughts on what you said? <clears throat> well, I think it's a good segue into the next uh, segment to talk a little bit about the risks associated with culture. So if you take a step back, you know, for, for years, these concepts, risk, 
culture have been maybe disconnected, right? And a few years ago, um, Venable and, and I think other firms started to look at enterprise risk management, which some of you probably are working on in your firms today. That's based on things like continuous improvement. And if you go way back to Dr. Deming and total quality management, these have been um, programs, methodologies that firms have been trying to employ to deal with some of these things. And so we started to look at it interdisciplinary. And George and I are actually in different groups within the firm, but RCOM risk and compliance coalesced around how do we take an enterprise risk management approach to helping our clients evaluate the risks that culture is providing. And then when we started to see the regulators actually start talking about culture in a way that can you really regulate firm culture and what does that mean for you? Uh, that's really where we started to focus more uh, carefully on some of these issues. Now, I was a history major in college, so I'm a big fan of looking at the past and seeing the lessons learned. And one of the conclusions I have is we don't learn very much, right? You go back to Enron and WorldCom and Tyco, right? That results in what's the response in the industry? It's, well, we're going to pass some laws. And then people are going to have to comply with those laws. And then there are going to be regulations that are promulgated to implement those. And you'll have to comply with those. Okay, well, then what happens? Well, we have subverse, you know, various scandals, accounting, LIBOR, et cetera. Then we have the Great Recession. Okay, and what comes out of that? Dodd-Frank. June 18th, Federal Reserve's hosting this conference, right? OCC's semi-annual risk perspective. It's the same story. And we haven't been able to solve for this. And so maybe the, we have to get back to the root cause. And if we can help, whether it's interdisciplinary, right? You've got science, you've got law, you've got compliance and fiduciary duty, and you've got management all represented here. Trying to figure out a different way to approach this would be, uh, we, re we think is a, good, is a good thing to be talking about. Yeah. Hey Mike, what, one of the challenges I've seen with uh, the CRM um, implementing it is who, who owns it, right? So I think with culture, we have to ask ourselves who owns culture now. ERM would say everybody owns risk management. So mm -hmm. we'll tell an organization to assign responsibility, someone to measure, someone to make sure things are being done, it's lead in charge, um, you know, things, things fail. So, so is, is there a model or is, who, who do you think should, could, it could be cultural officers in some companies, right? Mm -hmm. It could be owned by compliance, it could be owned by HR, it could be owned by you know, different ex-com committee collectively, but any recommendations? Or? It's a great question and I think the problem is, is you have one size doesn't fit all. I also invite the rest of the panelists to talk about this is you're trying to figure out who owns it, right? Who's going to be accountable for this? One of the, when I was a CCO, one of the things that I always found interesting is I'd be sitting with a business owner and there would be an issue about a compliance policy and they would say, well, that's your problem. Uh, hang on a second. Yeah. That's everybody's problem, right? We need to work on this together to find a solution. So in each organization, it may be a different role. So we haven't found, at least in, in my experience, a way to say, you know, this is the way to, it's going to work for every single client, firm, et cetera. But to your point, if you don't have that owner, you will fail, right? And, and, and I think there's a distinction between, you mentioned measuring and managing, and actually owning it, right? So I think HR can measure and manage it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel strongly that the CEO, of the leader of a company and the board own it. Mm -hmm. And that has, to, that has to trickle down and they have to have the relevant policies and the relevant uh, structures in place to ensure that, it, that, that, that the organization actually functions in a way that you want it to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think if we go to the next slide, you know, we're trying to bring the reality here, right? And uh, George is going to speak on some of these issues, but the SEC, you know, is very focused on issues associated with what at the end of the day is behavior. The end of the day is culture related in some respects, but I'm not sure we've, we've figured out what the solution is yet. You know, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I think this, the solution is facing us, you know, clearly. And the problem is, is that we're humans and there's failings and that, you know, I think vigilance is the issue is how do you stay on top of things and how do you stay ahead of what the next issue will be? Um, you can look and you, you've seen the Tycos, the Enron examples that you don't see much of that out there. You see other kinds of failings, I think. Um, and that's, I think, is, is vigilance. And, you know, speaking about tone at the top, I mean, the regulators have, you know, going back to Enron and, and Tyco, you know, the mantra was tone at the top, tone at the top. And now it's become, well, it's not just tone at the top. It's how effective is your compliance program? And 
from my perspective, what I what I see in failings is, yes, you will see the CEO, you will see, you know, um, C level, um, you know, um, employees saying, look, at the end of the day, this is our tone at the top. But how is it instilled and ingrained within? the the entity itself i think it starts from hiring it starts all the way through and it starts with recognizing individuals who who share that firm value and rewarding that yeah. thing so that's that's part of it and, I, and these these cases that, that we've highlighted here i think they're up there for a couple of reasons <laughs> One is the, there are a couple of cases that involve failures of, of firms and entities from a compliance standpoint first to 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 um cases that the SEC brought and that ended up into settlements. Um, you know, the first case involved uh, disclosure of conflict of the conflicts of interest. Firm had policies relating to this, but the problem was that they were paper policies ultimately. Um, and that that's important is how are you, do you stay on top of these policies? And I think it remains, it's a part of remaining vigilant. Um, same thing with uh, the 13 private fund advisors for repeated filing failures. Again, policies are ingrained within the firm itself. There are policies there, but ultimately the firm itself didn't follow those policies. Um, so then these, these other two cases, the other, the other remaining cases involved individuals ultimately. And I, I highlight those because you can't guard against every bad actor ultimately. Um, in these cases, it's interesting because um, those individuals actually hid, obfuscated their, their, their wrongdoing ultimately. Um, and the SEC didn't bring cases against the entities themselves and highlighted in the individual cases the policies that were in place there. I, I think that's significant. Uh, and I think as a regulator, uh, what I've heard is, look, we want you to come in and show us what your policies were and how you followed up on those policies. It's not only, okay, what, what you did as to these policies, how do, you, how do you guard against that bad actor, but what do you do when you do find one? It's interesting, we, we, we've talked about it before this, is it's a zero tolerance policy, I think. If you could show that and walk in there and said, look, you know, we clean this up. We remediated, um, and you know, I, I, I think there there are failures that that rise to a level of okay. Does this person need more training? Was there a failure there, or is this person such a bad actor that look at the end of the day we need to fire and terminate this person? But it doesn't stop there. Where did the failure occur within the organization itself? What were our supervisors doing? What was the the culture that maybe let this happen? Um, and, and, and that's what I see as a really effective remediation program. It's not just looking at this particular person and let's take action against that person. It's looking more globally and saying, look, what are, what are we doing in our organization to allow this? Some call that the control environment, right? Like the environment that your controls live in. It's not, not only do you need to have those controls, but you need an environment that's supportive of that. Like when we talk about whistleblower provisions, it's not just having the provision and the law and the protections, but it's internally in your organizations. How do you support that speak out culture? How do you ensure that people are going to use those tools? I'm a mom of two young children, and if there's one thing I've learned about innate human psychology is that it's what you said about rewards working better than punishment. You just see it in children, and all the research is coming out to say, like, spanking doesn't work, and timeouts don't even work, and it's like, well, what does work? <laughs> it's rewarding good behavior, and of course, you have to stop dangerous things from happening, um, and there, there is a role for discipline and punishment for sure, um, but I think what we're learning, and possibly what you've hit on, Michael, is that we have these compliance programs in place. We have these controls. We think we have a good control environment. Why are we still not succeeding? Why do we still see these kinds of problems? And I wonder if it really comes down to, at least in its simplest form, we're not rewarding enough of the good behavior. And I think it's reward. Oh, go for it. Go ahead, Scott. Well, I was going to say that I think it's, re on the one hand, it's reward. On the other hand, it's how do you instill in your employees a level of pattern recognition yep. that, that, it causes them to act a certain way. It's difficult because when most of this stuff happens, you really don't want to shine a spotlight on it and you really don't want to amplify it and, and turn it into a learning experience. But you kind of have to find ways to, to be able to do that if you're going to get people to recognize that when they're faced with a choice that they should be acting a certain way. And look, I, 
you know, we, as I mentioned earlier, we keep revisiting some of the same things. And, you know, the sign of insanity is, you know, you find out there's a problem, but you keep going back and hit your head on the wall again. Maybe it's time to look at it a little differently. I mean, it, and the other problem is whether you're an operating company or you're in financial services or you're a regulated uh, business, when you look at the facts of these cases, if you read each of these, you'd say, yeah, those people should have been punished because what they were doing was fraudulent. But the result is, is then a regulator concludes that, well, this is happening throughout the industry. So we're going to take an approach that, again, paints the entire industry with a particular brush and makes everybody's life more difficult. So maybe we need to get back to, okay, how do we change the behavior? And that's where, you know, psychology comes in, the policies and procedures come in. And, you know, I think it's a good segue actually to James to talk about what it's like to be managing this, you know, on the ground. So a couple of things. One, someone made a comment about uh, culture, culture from the top. Uh, years ago, I was actually with a uh, large insurance company here in New York. And the first day I actually uh, joined my profit center office, who actually ended up becoming the CEO and chairman, they told me, don't stand too close to the mic. And the- <laughs> Um, the first, the, his first conversation with me was, I never want to see our name in the paper. That was, he, he became the chairman. That was our, our guidelines. Anything we did, do not put, put our name in the paper. And we, we still use that today. I'm at a different organization, and to answer the one question, we have a head of risk who actually is a senior person within the organization who reports to our CEO. So that's, that's how risk is an extremely important thing. Again, I'm with Emeritus. We never want to see our name in the paper for something that an individual did that was that was incorrect or, or misguided. It's it's very hard to control. So I, I you know I head up besides fiduciary services. It's, it's a great title, but it, what does it really mean? I actually head up supervision for the organization plus some other stuff. So on a daily basis, we see the motivation of individuals and what, what is really motivating them. And, you know, did something just come out of surrender, an insurance policy, you know, and they're, they're flipping it over. So when we, when we were getting ready for this panel, and actually at FINRA conference this year, this, uh, this professor from Washington University made this comment that culture is a shared set of assumptions. Is everyone on board with your assumptions? And when it was said, it was, it was pretty funny because I'm sitting there going, that that's pretty pretty much what you're looking for. How is everyone looking at how you want them to do it? You know, what is the culture? What is the behavioral behind it? You know, what is their motivation? And, and if you go back to Scott's slides of from left to right, bad motivation. Well, a lot of times bad motivation is, hey, they get a little bit higher commission on this product than this product. Well, in this in this day and age of best interest, you know, you have to get down to the nitty gritty. So, part of our, our Part of it is also training. You know, we talked about it a little bit earlier, but not only training to the field on products, but training internally, because we have conversations on a daily basis. I can tell you right now, my staff is having conversations with individuals about a product they sold that just doesn't make sense. And what we find out is a lot of people don't understand the products. So that's how it starts rolling as well. So uh, one of the things that also with culture and if you go to the next slide, both FINRA and the SEC have really been on this, as they pointed out, for the last several years. And so here are a couple of things that you know, FINRA and the SEC have said about culture, and I'm not going to read it. But. So FINRA, two years ago, actually came around to organizations, not about an exam, but they wanted to speak with the senior management of financial institutions to find out, what is your culture? What are you about? What do you find important? You know, how do you... Uh, promote individuals? How do you discipline individuals who don't follow your culture? So that was actually a very enlightening uh, time because we had senior management people sitting there scrambling going, I I don't understand what they're really asking. And and later on, there's the questions that they actually did ask us and you had to answer them to them. And they they were there to find out what are you about? What is your culture about? So I think it's very important that you do understand what is your set of assumptions? And then, as, uh, as George pointed out, the SEC has long been looking at this in, in culture and, you know, culture of compliance, you know, ethics, behavioral modifications of individuals. I, I think we're always going to be challenged with that. I, I don't think there's a, a silver bullet out there. There's individuals who are motivated by different things. How do we determine what their motivation is? 
Um, a lot of times it's having those conversations. I, I tell people all the time, email's great, but I hate email. Because unless you speak to someone, you really don't know what they're talking about. Because email can be construed and you look at it, you're like, oh, they're, they're upset about something. You talk to them, they're not upset. They just, it's just how it came across. And then when you talk to them as well, you find out very quickly what, what are their motivating factors? What, what are their um, environment that they're looking at? So, so here, here are some of the questions that Finner actually did ask. It's in your packet as well. So uh, actually, it's the next one. Thanks. So some of the summary, the, you know, what are some of the key policies and, and processes of an organization? You know, what, how do you measure things? How do you measure how uh, the cultural values of you? How do you identify policy breaches? So George mentioned that earlier. That's one of the more important things. Is when, you, when a breach happens, what do you do and how do you handle it? Um, we don't hide it. If something happens and we discover it, we talk about it. Um, again, it, it's just, our culture is we do not want to be on the paper. Um, and I don't think anyone in this room can actually sit there and hold up their hand and say, yeah, I've, I've seen emeritus in the paper. One, if you know who emeritus is, I'm thankful about that. But two, <laughs> I, 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 I live in Nebraska, so when I also said to everyone, I said, I'm really happy to be in New York. Not so much. <laughs> Well, maybe, just, I, I think I passed more people walking here than are on the whole state, but that's another story. Maybe to, to just jump in on that, too, in terms of a little inside baseball, I spoke on a panel out in St. Louis that was a regional SIFMA conference, and the panel was focused on um, you know, high-risk and recidivist brokers. That was the actual topic, high-risk and recidivist brokers. This is something that merited an entire topic for a regional conference, right? And we had a member of FINRA on the panel. And, you know, they, one of the things that was interesting to us was after the surveys, you didn't necessarily hear what the conclusions were from the surveys. And we kept wondering, okay, when is FINRA going to share their information with us? And they haven't. But when there was a slide that the, the FINRA uh, senior persons from FINRA presented at how they uh, analyze these issues, and they had a quantitative and a qualitative category. And in quantitative, they said firm culture was one of the categories. First of all, I was curious why it was in quantitative versus qualitative. But it's, in, it's being baked into when they do an exam or a review, it's being baked into how they're looking at you. So this is still out there. It's percolating. And again, this is one of the reasons we put this panel together was to try to bring this to everyone's attention maybe in a more meaningful way. And Mike, on, on that point, uh, when you said, why is it in quantitative versus qualitative? I knew you were going to jump in on that. <laughs> I had to jump in on it, which is, this is the point of what I was bringing up earlier. It's sort of a, a question as I'm listening to you talk about the regulatory environments. Um, from my standpoint, you can quantitatively, as I pointed out, measure these things. Do you, do you think that has a value to FINRA? Is that, is that one of the ways in which this can be shorn up for the regulatory bodies is to institute your own quantitative measures on culture? Well, it was interesting because in sort of pulling on that thread, um, the person from Finris said that they have an algorithm where they take the data and they put it in the black box and they come out with outputs. And then in the firm culture uh, standpoint, the scoring was more relational. And, you know, from my tech days, it was almost like a relational database, right, where they're relating your behavior to the people next to you, to your supervisor, to the other members of your group, to your interactions with clients and customers, as opposed to where I thought they were going to go was behavior, mm -hmm. per se. So, you know, that's a different way of approaching it. So let me ask a question. How, what, are, what is that data? So, Scott, how do you go about identifying someone's motivational quality? Is it a self-assessment? Are you observing? Is yeah, it a so it's, it's a great question. So it's self-assessment. I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, we have an instrument that gets at all these things uh, in about a, a six to seven minute survey amongst all yeah. employees. Um, every employee gets a, can get a motivational profile. Uh, we even give employees reports so they can kind of help understand themselves. Uh, managers can get reports on teams. You can look at it on the overall organization. Um, so, yeah, we do a self-assessment with people in a very quick, uh, uh, very quick survey. And the way that this gets instituted is you can obviously institute it as an ongoing monitoring technique to see what's happening. But I want to relate this back to an earlier point about rewarding good behavior and giving rewards and these things. Because as, as I pointed out, rewards can, can sometimes be problematic motivationally. What you can do if you're measuring these things is you can actually look 
by giving these instruments out, what's the impact of a change in our policy or a change in our reward structures? Because ultimately that's going to be a, a way for you to get a barometer on how is this impacting? Again, it's a leading indicator, the motivations and orientations of the, of each employee and in the culture, that's going to be way upstream of trying to, um, put a fire out behaviorally down the road. And so, so it's actually a very practical way that, um, uh, that it can yeah. be administered. Right. That's great. Anybody doing anything like that, Scott and James, in your organization? Well, James, I think you had mentioned when we were talking about dealing with the person in the industry, right, who may have a potential issue on their form U4 or U5. Yeah, so it's funny that Michael was at that uh, conference. Actually, on Monday, I have a uh, meeting to go to. We have an individual who wants to join us. Unfortunately, the individual was sat down by FINRA for 90 days for doing something that uh, was morally or culturally an issue. It wasn't a, a product that he sold. It wasn't something that he did. He he he, he posted something online about a, another individual, another broker who he was upset about. He didn't do it once. He didn't do it twice. He did it three times, um, and it was very derogatory. It was on Craigslist, so you can let your mind figure out what he was trying to do. <laughs> Um, to the point where FINRA, I mean, took an action against them. So the question now is, well, from a heightened supervision standpoint, so Michael's at that conference, how do you put an individual on heightened supervision for morality or for culture? That's, that's a difficult one. Uh, for me, it's easy. We just don't hire them because you, you just, I, I, I'm just not going to do it. I don't see how I'm going to do it. Um, but those are things that happen every day, and those are where – you know, when we actually discussed this case with our CEO and said, listen, this is the situation, she was, and she, her comment was, you need to push back on the business side and say, no, we, that's just not who we are. And I, I think that's part of, again, that's from the top, but that's a typical, to me, a typical insurance company where they're, hey, our name is more important than one individual. Scott Mazarski, would you like to talk to us a bit about how to maximize um, from culture, from, from an insider's perspective no <laughs> sure um, and I think there's a couple of oh, sorry. Nice. but the, you know really really the first the first question to the, that, w that we talked about attacking was how culture impacts risk and a lot of this is common sense I mean Scott Rigby uh, we go by Scott squared on this panel <laughs> Scott Rigby uh, was channeling his inner uh, Potter Stewart earlier when he said, I know it when I see it. And um, I, I genuinely, especially being at Bloomberg, I genuinely believe that when you walk into an organization within a few days, you know what that organization stands for, what behaviors are tolerated, and whether it's the sort of organization where you can bring things forward and ask the right questions that help you mitigate risk. Mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when we speak with clients, there's really four words that we use when we're talking about this transparency, challenge, humility, and curiosity. If you're in a transparent organization that shares relevant information with everybody involved in decision making, and that is open about the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly, you're less likely, you're going to make more informed decisions and you're less likely to go down a path that's going to put you in jeopardy. If you're in an organization that, you know, um, not only tolerates challenge, but frankly encourages people to challenge things, you're less likely to be in a position where you're in the crosshair. So a great example of that is, is a hedge fund, right? Often they're run by very powerful and, and successful traders, and often it's one individual who carries the firm. But the reality is when they have oversized positions, you want others at the firm to be challenging that person. You want people to be asking the right questions. If your culture doesn't tolerate that, then you're going to be you're you're you're, you're putting yourself in a, in in a difficult position. Same thing with humility. You're not always right. Same thing with curiosity. Right? You want people who aren't necessarily within the small core group involved in decision making to be able to ask questions. You want to tolerate questions. You want a flat organizational culture, not only a transparent one. So going on to the next slide, you know, and this is an interesting one for me. You know, I I. I other than, you know, my charm and charisma, I wondered initially why Michael wanted me on this. And also the fact that Scott Rigby and I haven't seen each other in about 25 years, but we went to the greatest liberal arts college in the entire world, Williams 
together. Um, so, so that was kind of a cool thing. But I kind of said, okay, so how am I going to add value in this panel? Um, because, you know, I'm, I, I'm not working for a financial institution. I'm working for a company and, and I run our business across the legal market, but I'm working for a larger group that, that obviously plays and is a key player in the finance industry and the securities industry. Um, and I think that's highly relevant and, and, and it's, it's pretty, um, common knowledge out there that we've had our own bouts with more on the editorial side with, you know, having to, to have, having to balance getting scoops and being in a strong position versus having a type of culture that carries itself in a transparent way and, and, and aligns with our values. Um, but the other thing is really where, where I really think it, it's an interesting perspective for everybody in the room is how Mike, and it all starts with Mike Bloomberg, has built the company I'm in and the group I'm in, and it really is all founded on, we could talk about tone from the top, we could talk about the board of directors asking the right questions, we could talk about sort of the textbook things that you read about when you read about risk culture and, and how culture impacts risk. What's really interesting to me is are some of the other things that, that Mike Bloomberg and the team have done at Bloomberg that kind of um, facilitate and drive a culture of transparency and an open culture and a culture built on values and ethics, open plan. So the, I worked for, before coming to Bloomberg for 14 years for a British public company, um, seven years as general counsel, seven years on the business side. And uh, when we went to open plan, we said we were doing it to copy Bloomberg. We'll get all the benefits of, of, of spontaneity and, and, and energy and people collaborating and transparency. Nobody could hide. Um, and, and, you know, a flat organization. But we were really doing it to save money. We wanted high density. We wanted to cram as many people into space. Nobody wanted to say that, but that was clearly the reality of a public company wanting to make, make its margins in an area where not too many people were growing. Bloomberg actually... All the stuff I just said, Bloomberg actually believes that. And that's the beauty of Bloomberg as an organization. And Bloomberg does have a zero tolerance policy. We had a recent example. Uh, one of my colleagues in the audience, Yedna Ladd, who, who knows this one well, not because she's not ethical, mm -hmm. but because, because <laughs> she, she's one of our leaders on the commercials. I'm glad you qualify that, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. This is being recorded. Um, so, so um, you know, there's another player in, in, in the industry that, that arguably is engaging in practice is that are um, that that are anti-competitive and involve tying and there was a recent one of the larger associations sent a lawyer's letter to them and there's a potential dispute going on and it related to us in the sense that not only was it a competitor but it related to practices with your customers putting their interests first not necessarily pushing them to the highest valued or, or the highest price solution, not necessarily going for the highest commission. Somebody before mentioned different commission rates. By the way, I, I, my, our view, my view, I, I, you know, this is where I give my disclaimer about anything I say is my personal view and not the views of Bloomberg LP uh, or Bloomberg BNA. But nothing's wrong with making money. Nothing's war wrong with commission structures that reward salespeople for selling products that are in line with the strategy of the company. Where you go off the rails is when that, when your culture enables people to do that without regard for what's in the best interest of your customers and, mm -hmm. and without regard to sharing all relevant information with your customers. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're really sensitive to. Another thing that I'd mentioned that, that actually does relate to culture and transparency and a lot of what we're talking about today is the issues that come up often with millennials and with employees, things like sustainability, things like philanthropy, things like diversity and conclusion, because they're all thought of in kind of the same bucket of an organization that within its values cares about things that are good, cares about things that most people would look at. You know, it's the business judgment rule. Most people would look at a reasonable person would look at it and say, this is an organization that stands for ethical things. This is an organization that is built on, that has a foundation of values. So stressing those things and, and with your actions, ensuring employees can participate in those things sends a message and makes people more comfortable coming forward, challenging issues and with transparency. Maybe along those lines in terms of bringing it back to some of the um, core issues about incentives, right? Mm -hmm. I've been involved in a prior life in actually developing incentive compensation plans and trying to figure out how do you drive performance, but how do you also make sure that you're staying within the boundaries of what's ethical or even legal? 
And one of the things that we uh, decided was in the prior history, all you had for the sales organization and the salespeople was a base commission plan on their sales. We said, okay, that means that it just becomes about that salesperson. We then increased uh, or the opportunity to earn uh, compensation by creating a departmental sales compensation plan, and then ultimately a company-wide incentive so that there were, it wasn't just about them. It wasn't just about their sales. So they had some incentive to want to work together with other people in their department, some incentive to want to expand a relationship at a client so that it wasn't just, it's my client. No, it's the firm's client, et cetera. And then also try to reward them at the end of the day for things that promoted the values of the organization, that it wasn't always just about, okay, how many, what, what did you hit your sales quota? And that's difficult for, you know, financial services industries because for so long, those compensation plans have been driven by, you know, what are your sales? Mm -hmm. And trying to figure out, is that the only incentive? And is that motivating behavior that, you know, from the behavioral uh, psychology perspective is going to result in bad behavior? And wh how do you shape that? It's not an easy topic. And everybody in the room at the, at the SIFMA conference would say, all right, well, you're telling me to basically blow up my entire sales organization. Not blow it up, but maybe we need to think about it a little differently. And James, you mentioned um, that you really like to have conversation um, with your staff and with members of the firm as opposed to email and even possibly phone calls. So how, what, what do you use those conversations to do in sort of to make meaningful impact on culture? And, and is there something, is there sort of a next level of that where you sort of take what you've gleaned from your conversations and you take sort of look at that on a quarterly basis or what have you and kind of ask yourself, what are the messages? I'm getting? What am I hearing? And where does that information need to make its way into to sort of help us shift if we need to make a shift? Yeah. So we, um, the reason we do the phone calls again is I, I just, e email is good for a lot of things. Yeah. Finding out what motivates someone, what is someone's about, especially for us, it's what's their practice about? You know, wh what are they trying to do? What are they looking at holistic for client? And actually on a weekly basis, my team gets together and each of them come with something that they were dealing with during that week. And that way we can actually sit there and Great. bring it across everyone. So there's 20 of them who are looking at these different things. So, you know, it, it takes a little bit of time and it takes a little bit of effort, but they come every week. What, what was one of the difficult things? What are you looking at? And what has happened here is we are much more uh, transparent about what we're doing and what we're looking at. So if we're seeing something, the whole group will know about it. And then what we do is we try to get that out back out to the field. So as those conversations are taking place, people are relaying the information that they've heard. So I, I just think the art of the phone call has some, yeah. sometimes been dropped off. And we're, we're just trying to bring it back again. A lot of times it is just to find out about that individual who's on the other end. I consistently hear, I run these other um, panels on the topic of behind the crime and I, I'm often sitting in front of um, uh, ex-convicts or uh, fel uh, felons who are talking about how they found themselves on the wrong side of the law and the consistent theme I've heard is that they were in a vacuum with respect to their decision making. They didn't have that opportunity to gut check with others or they didn't take that opportunity. And it sounded like had they had more of those along the sort of spectrum of decision making, um, they, there could have been different outcomes. Maybe actually, George, I mean, one of the benefits of, you know, being outside counsel and essentially a consultant is you get to see a lot of different firms and how they handle things like this and maybe take some best practices away. But in your practice, you're frequently dealing with the folks who are already in trouble. Right. And maybe you could just comment on what are some of the observations from that perspective? Well, I think everyone's hit upon it. I mean, I think having an open door and being transparent and having a culture where people feel like they're able to to get guidance and they're not just sitting isolated alone on their own little island trying to make their numbers, right? That's that's part of the culture and feeling invested and empowered within that to take up the resources that you provide, that you provide. That's where I think, you know, it's, it, it's you see it time and time again, I think. Um, and, you know, it's not just one silver bullet like you mentioned. I mean, it's, 
it starts from top down and throughout the culture, I think, being empowered to take advantage of everything um, available to you to get the guidance that you need. Um, but like you said, ultimately, sometimes there are just bad actors that you can't. You know, you, you, there, there's nothing that you can do. And I think that there, are, there will always be those SEC cases, the regulated cases, they'll be there. Um, but from a firm standpoint, how do you guard against that and from being infected within your, your, your entity? And I just think it's, it's vigilance. It's, it starts from top down. Mike Bloomberg, like you said, I mean, it's how invested are you? Are you providing resources? Um, you know, that's got to be something that's continually looked at. Um, and I think, you know, um, you know, organizations like yours, I mean, th- th- you're doing it and, and it shows, I think, keeping your name out of the paper, <laughs> it shows. Um, so and I think that is key. It's your actions, right? It's all good to say this stuff, but, you know, are you providing training? Are you taking a portion of somebody's incentives? It doesn't have to be a big portion, but a portion and tying it to metrics other than just financial. Financial still is going to be the bulk of it because it's ultimately how an organization's measured. But are you are you at least acknowledging through your actions on incentives that this matters and is important? You know, are you bringing an outside perspective, whether it's somebody like Scott, whether it's somebody from, you know, a, a company or an organization that isn't competitive with you to share perspective because when you're in it, mm-hmm. your employees often are only getting the perspective of your organization. Not that it's a bad thing, but it's always good to have other perspectives as long as you agree with them. And one, thing, one thing I'll mention is, uh, as I was listening to Scott talk about how Mike Bloomberg was authentically, at least from authentic, there was this authentic culture building, right? And so this idea of you can just say the right words, but then there's the implicit message, but then there's the authentic message. How does this, though, get experience in the employees? Again, to come back to, okay, how can we really get to this? You know, part of, I, I focus a lot on this idea of motivational quality, Part of the, the, the standard panel, what we measure in organizations is also um, how do employees feel that their basic needs, basic psychological needs, I don't mean needs for food and water and money, but actually their basic psychological needs are being supported by the organization. And we have specific needs that we know are, are critical for thriving, for well-being, for all kinds of positive outcomes, uh, needs for mastery and growth which comes through training, as Scott was just mentioning, needs for autonomy, which a lot of times people think is independence and, you know, regulators get scared of this idea of autonomy because it's like a wild west. But that's not what autonomy is when we measure it. Autonomy is that people are really endorsing the path that they're on, even when, even when that path is something that's controlled or regulated, right? That sense of endorsement. And then the other one is relatedness. So we all have a basic need for relatedness, to connect meaningfully to others that matter to our coworkers. And you can measure how well those needs are being fulfilled and how well managers and policies in an organization are supportive of those basic needs. And that, that actually becomes kind of a, a way or to, that you can be both defining and measuring this idea of these authentic cultures where the messages from the top, which are so important, actually feel genuine to people. Well, there's also, it sounds cliche, but there's this concept that it's one of the boats on the slide, celebrating success, but also celebrating failure. Mm-hmm. Risk in an organization is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just a question of, of, of through celebrating failure, through celebrating areas, instances where, and it's, you know, it's, it's much different with discrete things where you have somebody trying to sell something with a commission. But, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're celebrating failure in a way that, that, that shines a light for people on what type of risks are tolerable, what type of risk can drive an organization forward, I think that makes a, makes a big difference. Look, in some, in terms of some of the takeaways from this, this uh, presentation in looking at my clients and the ones that I think have done a better job of creating a good culture and, a, and therefore a better job of avoiding some of these uh, traps for the unwary is you start with sort of the onboarding process, right? The, some of the best firms that I work with spend an enormous amount of resources on the hiring piece. It's not, you know, just using monster. It's, they are, are, they actually have a very detailed process, which includes technology and human touch where they're really getting a sense of who they're hiring. And these are, you know, very large firms where there's a fair amount of, of turnover and you, you see the results, right? Are they in the paper? Well, they're not in the paper very often. And if they are, they're generally, you know, able to manage through it. That's the choke point, right? 
is the bad actors, if you can prevent them from coming into the organization, you've done a great job of mitigating this risk that's associated with culture. Then I think the next stage of it is, what kind of training are you providing around the firm's culture, around the firm's policies and procedures, around the firm's strategy? Um, Most successful companies I've worked with, everybody in the organization is crystal clear on what the vision, mission, and strategy are of the firm, whether it's the CEO or it's the receptionist when you walk in the door. They all know what the firm is about, and they all know what the culture is and what the expectations are and that they're going to be held accountable for it. Uh, And and I guess the last thing I'll say and invite the rest of the panel to speak as well on this is it's never, it's never, you can't declare victory. And that's why this is tough, right? You did a great job last year, but next year you're starting from zero again. And the next time you see your name in the paper for the wrong reason, well, that may mean that all of that good work, 20 years of reputation has been destroyed in 20 minutes, you know, the old saying. So you have to constantly be vigilant. And it requires an investment. And then you're trying to balance that about running a business, right? I still got to pay the bills. I still got to pay people. I still got to be profitable. Otherwise, my share price is going to tank and we could go out of business. Any other comments or thoughts? Or I was so profound. That was it. (laughs) (laughs) Question? You mentioned recruitment on Claudia a couple of times. There is a group called Adam Grant, Keepers and Takers. Do you have any thoughts very specifically about the kind of questions you should be asking to make sure that you get those keepers. The keepers will give you that good culture, that ethical culture. They interlink well with others. But what a lot of us before, obviously, there's been a lot of, you know, yeah. but it's very systematic and, and, and qualifies everything. So you know, we could say it's very soft, you know, but, but I mean, he's so specific about qualifying the questions on how to assess the keepers. Mm-hmm. What types of incentives, formal and, and informal, they should be given to us? And, and the learning and development. So a very, very specific and systematic way to make sure that we provide this culture of giving that will minimize risk long term. And, and I love how specific he is yeah. with explaining how it works. You want to comment on that? Yeah, no, I love Adam's work. And, you know, he's kind of a, you know, we're, we're kind of simpatico and, uh, uh, you know, he talks about our research and we talk a lot about his research. And what I really love about uh, about him is exactly is sort of what I've been talking about today is, hey, I keep chiming and saying, you know, you can measure these things. You know, it's possible. It's not just a concept. Um, and Adam, of course, um, because he's had the time to be really interfacing a lot with the business world, has a great way to make these ideas accessible um, and practical for, for application. So I think that's exactly the right idea is um, – you know, to be leveraging uh, the this, the science that is there and evidence-based science that is there for measuring these things and then taking, you know, uh, appropriate actions. I think that's all we have time for, but I really want to thank everybody for joining us today. I want to thank Venable for hosting this and Bloomberg Law for co-hosting it. Um, and I hope that we've given you a lot of food for thought as you make your way through the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.